This morning we're at Stuart Shirley's shop in Broomfield, Colorado, and he's going to show us how to make a all forged blacksmith's helper or work stand without arc welding. So that should be an interesting demo. Let's head on inside. That's how you know. Well, this is what Stuart's going to show us. It adjusts just by lifting up. It has this little lever to release it and is a pretty cool work stand. What I really like about this dead man is if you need it higher, you can just literally grab it with your hand and pull it up. There's no set screws to fiddle with or anything. And then to drop it down, you just push on the lever and it drops down. Um, this one, I put the tabletop on it just because the patina is so nice and I took such a long time to finish the piece, I decided to keep it more for an indoor table and use it either as an impromptu kind of bar table or end table at the, at the end of the couch. Um, but there's two plates on it. There are two triangular plates. The smaller one at the top is a 9-inch equilateral triangle, and then the larger one on the bottom is a 12-inch equilateral triangle. And then I put the dimensions on here for you guys, so if you want to replicate these, you can see where to lay out the holes for everything, um, and where to pull the lines. And I've already, I already started and finished the smaller triangle, so you guys can see what we're going for today. Um, and then Garrett and I will finish up the larger triangle, and uh, you can see that forging procedure. You guys have any questions so far? I know it's a little, a little squeezed and packed. Is there a purpose for the bolts sticking out? No, that's all aesthetic. Uh, so that that one we built with carriage bolts, and that's kind of Pat Pat Quinn, who I was working with in New York. That's his style of nut and fastener. Um, it's a really easy way to make a nut that. You don't, you can use any kind of, you can use a wrench on it to tighten up. But we just left them long, stylistically. We're going to rivet this one together today, so it's going to be a much more flush, clean looking uh, outline and silhouette. Alright, if you guys don't have any other questions, I've got one leg finished, so We'll do one more leg like this where we'll punch, we'll do the foot. We're going to do a little bit different style foot for each leg um, just because I couldn't settle on one style and I want to try a couple different things. And then we'll punch another leg that's just like this with two holes. And then the third leg where the, the tensioning handle will go, we're going to punch this closer hole to the heel because the dimensions from the heel up to where each of the rivets are really important. So we'll punch this hole first, then we'll punch the hole for the tensioning arm. It doesn't really matter where that falls between the two rivets. And then we'll measure again from the heel up to this hole and punch it, just in case we have any growth or shrinkage from punching the hole for the tensioning arm. All right. Punch the hole and we're going to use fuller bends today for really targeting and getting exact bends where we want them. And then uh, we just, I didn't like the way the little triangular nub looked on the end of the drifted hole, so we just cut that off. Five months, I took a break from school to go work at Center for Metal Arts with Patrick Quinn and Dan Neville. Um, I think it was one of the best decisions I've ever made in college to leave metallurgy and take a break. I realized that I was really unhappy taking 18 credits a semester and always studying. Um, and so getting to go there was probably one of the most intensive and skill improving events I've ever done because I spent every day foraging. I got to forage every day for five months. Um, the last month and a half while I was there, I forged tongs for, five out, for eight hours a day, every day. All right, so I've already center punched where 
I want these holes to be, and I can't see this one. There it is. Light one. And so I'm going to start out with a light hit and make sure that the center of my tool is actually in the center punched hole. And as we punch down. Um, I don't know if there's really a particular reason for doing oval hole other than it was simple enough to try and get the perimeter of this to be the same perimeter as a three quarter inch hole. Um, and then the other thing here is I'm trying to cool down this hole before I go to back punch. That was one reason Garrett and I had been practicing was punching. This is the first time I've punched quarter inch plate. I don't care for it too much. Oh, we've almost got it off. One more. Um, but New Course Steel was more of a metallurgy internship and I spent the summer working on uh, uh, sheet metal. I was in the hot mill for a sheet mill which was one of the coolest things I've ever seen. There's nothing like see hearing a slab of steel come out of the caster and then it goes through a couple reheat furnaces that are about the length of a football field and then there's its two inch slab and it hits that first rolling stand and just this kakoosh and then it speeds up as it goes through the succeeding six rolling stands so it's just boom 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 and it that that sound as you're going from two inch down to eighth inch or thinner sheet metal is just so cool and seeing this thick bar sluggishly come in and sheet metal flying out the other end is phenomenal. Really cool uh, sight. If you ever get the opportunity to tour a sheet mill, do not pass it up. It's awesome. All right, lightly. One more. Go ahead and knock that out. Here is I'm going to set it to about the width of the thinnest part on this drifted hole. And then I'm going to drag around the top side here and just make a very rough, rough outline of the curve that I'm going to want to cut. I don't know if you guys can see that line I scribed there in the scale. Can you hold this, Garrett? And then I'm going to dig through this pile of tools and find the one I want. And then, so I've got just a rough curved chisel here. I don't know if you guys got that. Slide it back just a little, Garrett. And I'm just going to mark this cold, give a light line so I'll be able to see when I come out of the forge of where I'm cutting with the chisel. Thank you, Garrett. Nope, back on the anvil. All right, come off. Pull it back on. That side's still too thick. Alright, now come off. So I'm shearing over this edge of the anvil so I don't have to use a cutting plate. And this piece, I'm just going to break off. It doesn't want to cut very well. Here, I'll take it. All right, so I'm going to heat that back up, flatten it out, and then I'll rasp, hot rasp it really quick. Um, can you flatten that out real quick? Yeah. Flip 
it over. Alrighty. Thank you. Light. We're going to do one more pass. The other thing I'm doing is I'm making sure to, I'll make a hit and then I'll overlap the fuller about halfway to just try to keep the line inside smooth. And then also when I'm making that first pass, it's a lot easier to feel this back edge of the fuller in the line I've already made and the front toe kind of on my cold chisel mark. Fun. One more. And just let that cool. Did you go to Stone County Ironworks? Say that again? Go to Stone County Ironworks? I did not go to Stone County Ironworks. Where? It's somewhere up in northeast Arkansas. Northeast Arkansas. Or northwest Arkansas. Northwest? Okay. Oh, we got it. Oh, this one did not shear well. Give it one hit. One more. There we go. Yeah. Jeez. Do you want to try? No. Um, let's try going this way. One more. more. I'm trying to move around in this hole so that at one time, so I'm supporting that at least one edge of the hole we're drifting instead of just drifting right over the center, trying to prevent the steel from getting drugged down into the Pritchell hole as we drift. One more. Uh, this one. Just Jim. So you know, why you buy this here today? <laughs> what was that? That's why you buy this here today. Yeah. All right. Quick, you catch his hair, Stuart. Can you see it? Yeah. Uh, we're done with that for now. So now it's just a little bit of rinse and repeat from that last piece. Can you hold that, Garrett? Thank you. One more. 
Alright, come over. A little further. Pull it back on. Hold up. There we go. Back on. There we go. Flip it. Thank you. One more. All right. Do you have a fixed touch mark die for it? What? Do you have a fixed? There's a lot of sentimental value to me, and I don't like getting it super hot. I use this just for cold work. So a simple solution, you can make your own angle gauge just out of two pieces of steel and a bolt. Um, I put a wing nut on there so it's easy for me to loosen up. And then I just put a small tack on the back side so I don't need any tools to uh, hold that bolt. And then also the other thing that's nice about this is it's become a story stick for this project. So I've written on here uh, 13 inches and 21 and 3 eighths and those are the locations of the where the holes need to be punched measured from the floor up to the hole and then I also had 27 inches on here which is the length uh, I cut the initial leg to I changed that and then to I think I cut the legs at 25 inches long um, and so that that's become super useful and then I don't care if this gets hot um, if this doesn't survive this project oh well I'll make another one um, but it's a super handy tool to have and we'll be using it a fair amount on this project. Uh, so bending these, I'm not super easy. Super easy with that fuller in there. I'll come with my angle gauge. I need to bend a little bit more. And actually... I need to flatten this guy a bit. So I'm going to call that one good and move on to the next one. I think it was in one of uh, Clay's workshops up at Scott's that he, Clay said to me, forging fast and fiddling's forever and I believe it's totally true. You take no time at all to forge your parts and then once you start filing and getting things to fit, that's where all the work really comes in. Um, Garrett, would you grab the hacksaw there on the table? That as the intern, I basically was either helping teach or helping assist or do anything I needed in the classes, but uh, Seth Gould came and taught a class and Pat said you want to take the class so I got to take this hacksaw making class with Seth and 
it was a really eye-opening experience of how, mo how much you can do with a good sharp file and how, you, how well you can hide things by putting a center punch in the exact center of, a circ of what looks to a circle and how much more circular it looks and how you can trick the eye um, and how to, maybe if your hole isn't perfectly square, how you can file and adjust to get things to line up. And that class was super informative. Uh, the bolt and wing nut that are the tensioning device on that saw is about six to eight hours of filing and, and work. Um, that was one of the most intensive classes that I have ever been in. And it was phenomenal. There was one guy there who was a metalsmith from down in Florida and had never forged before and he finished his hacksaw in, during the class. It was really impressive. Um, if we can get Seth out for an RMS conference, that would be... going to be here next year. That's awesome. Because it's amazing some of the work he does. Uh, yeah, that lock. You can follow him on Instagram. Instagram, it's just amazing what he's doing. Yep. He's been working on it for like, what, six months? Yeah, so Seth is at Penland. He's a... Um, a resident artist at Penland and that's his study of work is making locks so he's made multiple bodies multiple pieces that are um, puzzle locks and right now he's working on a pretty pretty good sized chest that has two puzzle locks there's a puzzle lock that unlocks the other puzzle lock to unlock the box but the key is yeah. All right, so that's the other triangle plate done. I'm gonna set it down there. Um, in my shop, usually the hot, everything hot is on or under the coal forge is how I try to keep it. The really the exception for that is drifts. Um, assume all drifts are hot always, and. We should remain pretty safe in the shop today. Um, by half, I would have preferred one by three quarter. I like just the heavier look that it has on the stand. And I saved you guys the boredom and tedium of watching me break corners on the power hammer. Um, but I just heated up the lengths of the bar and just knocked off the corners under the hammer. Make it look a little less like store-bought bar. Um, hold up. Yep. So here's where I'm going up on more of that angle to get that end to drag out and get more of a curved end. It's a little uneven. Yep. Light. So that's kind of the shape I'm going for. On yep. One more. Um, if I were to make another one, I think I would do all three of the feet this way. I like it a little better than the three fullered foot, just my personal opinion. Um, but next, we're going to measure and lay out for the holes on this guy. Um, we need to go 13 inches for the bottom one and 21 and 3 eighths for the top. Do you have it a sharpen this on? Uh, that's enough. That's close enough. What? Um, let's mark the bottom one. We'll punch it and then we'll do the round hole mm -hmm. for the tensioner and then we'll measure and do the top one. Makes sense. Yeah, 13. Uh, here. Use this. This won't burn as bad. 
So to make this measurement, I'm going to try and hold this square, just a ruler, along the base of the foot. And then I'll lay this other ruler up against. Okay. Um, and half inch, just under. Do you want to punch this one from both sides or one side again? I don't care. What do you think? What did we do last time? Both sides? We did both on the other leg. Let's do both. Let's do both sides. Okay. Sorry. All right. Go ahead and transfer that, Garrett. So then I'll transfer around the mark to the other side and I'm gonna center punch mark on both of the large flat sides of the bar and we're gonna punch from both sides um, if you look closely at that leg that we already finished um, this top hole and bottom hole are slightly different in that if you look if you look from the side here there's more material on the bottom on this side of the top hole. That's because we punched from one side and so it, all the material that it pushed swelled out at the bottom and then we sheared out the slug. You never take out the same amount of material of the bar thickness. The extra material got pushed to the bottom. Whereas this bottom hole is a little more even in cross section than the top and looks nicer and that's because we punched from both sides. So we're going to try and do all of our punching from both sides to just get a little bit either, more even look to the hole. Um, here, you probably... This is the end of the first part of Stewart's demo. There will be three parts. So we'll pick up with part two here in the next video or two. And we will follow Stewart through making of this blacksmith's helper or work stand. Hope you're enjoying this. This was just a weekend demo at Stuart Shirley's shop. In the meantime, head out to your shop, make something, try to stay safe, and do wear your safety glasses. But we'll see you for the next one. Thanks for watching.